Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible Genesis chapters 14 and 15 from the Old Testament At that time Amraphel king of Shinar, Arioch king of Elisar, Kedor Lamir king of Elam, and Tidal king of nations went to war against Bera king of Sodom, Beersha king of Gomorrah, Shinab king of Admah, Shemeber king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. These last five kings joined forces in the valley of Siddim, that is the Salt Sea. For twelve years they had served Kedor Lamir, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Kedor Lamir and the kings who were his allies came and defeated the Rephites in Ashtaroth Karnaim, the Zuzites in Ham, the Emites in Sheva Kiriatham, and the Horites in their hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran, which is near the desert. Then they attacked En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, again, and they conquered all of the territory of the Amalekites, as well as the Amorites who were living in Hazazon Timir. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Admah, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out and prepared for battle. In the valley of Siddim, they met Kedorla Amir, king of Elam, Tidal, king of nations, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar. Four kings fought against five. Now the valley of Siddim was full of tar pits. When the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, they fell into them, but some survivors fled to the hills. The four victorious kings took all the possessions and food of Sodom and Gomorrah and left. They also took Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions when they left, for Lot was living in Sodom. A fugitive came and told Abram the Hebrew. Now Abram was living by the oaks of Mamre the Amorite. The brothers of Eshcol and Aner, all these were allied by treaty with Abram. When Abram heard that his nephew had been taken captive, he mobilized his 318 trained men who had been born in his household, and he pursued the invaders as far as Dan. Then, during the night, Abram divided his forces against them and defeated them. He chased them as far as Hoba, which is north of Damascus. He retrieved all the stolen property. He also brought back his nephew Lot and his possessions, as well as the women and the rest of the people. After Abram returned from defeating Kedorla Amir and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet Abram in the valley of Sheva, known as the king's valley. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was the priest of the Most High God. He blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by the Most High God, creator of heaven and earth. Worthy of praise is the Most High God, who delivered your enemies into your hands. Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything. Then the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and take the possessions for yourself. But Abram replied to the king of Sodom, I raise my hand to the Lord, the Most High God, creator of heaven and earth, and vow that I will take nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or a strap of a sandal. That way you can never say, it is I who made Abram rich. I will take nothing except compensation for what the young men have eaten. As for the share of the men who went with me, Aynard, Eshcol, and Mamre, let them take their share. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield and the one who will reward you in great abundance. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, 
What will you give me since I continue to be childless? And my heir is Eliezer of Damascus. Abram added, Since you have not given me a descendant, then look, one born in my house will be my heir. But look, the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but instead a son who comes from your own body will be your heir. The Lord took him outside and said, Gaze into the sky and count the stars. If you are able to count them, then he said to him, So will your descendants be. Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord considered his response of faith as proof of genuine loyalty. The Lord said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, by what can I know that I am to possess it? The Lord said to him, Take for me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. So Abram took all of these for him, and then cut them in two, and placed each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in half. When birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. When the sun went down, Abram fell sound asleep, and a great terror overwhelmed him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign country. They will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. But I will execute judgment on the nation that they will serve. After they will come out with many possessions, but as for you, you will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will return here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its limit. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot with a flaming torch passed between the animal parts. That day the Lord made a covenant with Abram. To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates River, the land of the Canaanites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. God, I was thinking a lot about this passage today. There's, there's so many lessons that we can take from this, and, and I'm sure the people listening are taking the pieces that they need to hear today and, and moving forward with what you want them to do, but I go, I go back to Abram and, and the fact that he's so insistent upon having an, an heir and so willing to replace somebody else as, a, as an heir instead of who will eventually become his real heir. Um, and God is just as adamant that he will have one in his old age. Um, and I just think about that story a lot. You know, I have friends who have kids, friends who don't have kids, and friends who desperately want kids. And, and I know that a lot of people take the story as, you know, wait on the Lord and the desires of your heart will be fulfilled. But I think it speaks even more to the fact that you will give us the desires of our heart for good that glorifies you. And I think that's a piece that we sometimes miss in our selfishness. We think if I have desires in my heart, if, if I want a child, if I want to get married, if, if I want a new job, if I, if I want, 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 and the Bible says you'll give us these desires of our hearts. What we miss is, is you're not going to do that. You're going to give us what is good for us. Uh, what we need at the time. Sometimes your best answers are no or wait. Um, you use wait with me a lot. Uh, and I was thinking about that uh, a couple days ago. You, you actually don't request us to wait, interestingly enough. Uh, you, you are doing so many things until the final results show up that we truly are never waiting if we're paying attention. There's all these things that you have us doing between now and when, when that announcement comes, whether it is the child or the new job or a new ministry position, but we're never truly waiting if we're wanting to do your will. Uh, your will is intentional and it's every day uh, for us and it's always for the best. So 
forgive my kind of rambling here, but I was just thinking a lot about that, that you're not going to give us what we think we need. You're going to give us something way better. And for that, God, I just thank you so much for loving, for loving somebody like me that much to give me so much. Somebody who doesn't deserve anything. <sighs> thank you so much. In your son's name we pray. Thank you.